the antenna is a transceiver, or receiver and transmitter, of energy. I looked at the human body, and especially the spine, as a transceiver. I believe, similar applies to buildings. We're told that these cathedrals, temples, pagodas, stupas, churches, mosques, and synagogues are just ornamental, aesthetic, artistic, without an added functional purpose. To probe this belief, let's first look at modern high-energy generators. This is a Marx generator. Marx generators generate a high-voltage pulse from a low-voltage DC supply, and they are used in high-energy physics experiments, as well as to simulate the effects of lightning on products, such as power line switchgear and aviation equipment. The generator is a cascaded series of repeated spark gap, resistor, and capacitor stages. These images are from this website, where it says, Using high voltage electricity, a rock can be split apart down to its grains without destroying the precious minerals inside, unlike traditional grinding and mechanical techniques that often ruin the sample. This is a high voltage generator in Istra, Russia. This photo is in the same location. This is a high voltage insulator. Let's now compare to ancient architecture. This one is called the Iron Pagoda. This pagoda is called Tianing. It's beautiful roof. Of course none of this has anything to do with energy, we are told. It's all just decoration, they say. I guess the name pagoda is also a coincidence. This is the entire pagoda forest at the Shaolin Temple on Mount Song. The human spine, and electricity transceiver in its own right, and the pagoda, have a lot in common. Ancient Chinese tradition builds the spine of the pagoda flexibly, so that it bends to wind and earthquakes. Pagodas are a near-perfect imitation of the human spine. As previously shown, the spine conducts electromagnetic energy. It's therefore not far-fetched to assume the pagodas were built for the same purpose. This is the king's chamber inside the Great Pyramid of Giza. The ancient Egyptian jad columns look like high-voltage insulators. The hieroglyph of this shape is called the backbone of Osiris. There's that spine reference again. This is a Japanese sorin. The word sorin means alternating rings. They traditionally top the Japanese pagoda. They are used in both Buddhist and Shinto structures, meaning these two distinct religions were perhaps not that distinct. According to the Wikipedia page, at the top, we find the jewel called Hoju, ancient German for high jewel, which is spherical. It is said to repel evil, and fulfill wishes, perhaps because the energy is being sent upwards. It's also found on pyramid roofs and tall poles. The page also says that it can have flames at the top, in which case it is called Kin Hoju. Kin is said to mean flaming. To me, Ka is the ancient word for energy, and N is an abbreviation for energy. The piece below it is Ryasha, the dragon vehicle. And below that, the Suyan, meaning water flame or water smoke, said to be four sheets of metal set at 90 degrees to each other, and installed over the main pillar of the pagoda. The fact that most of these objects refer to some kind of flame or smoke, is evidence enough that the ancients saw them as energy devices. The rings are usually called Kurin, or Nine Rings, even if there are only eight or seven of them. At the bottom we find upturned lotus petals, usually eight, called Yukabana, meaning receiving flower. After all, the antenna is not only a transmitter, but also a receiver. The Sorin looks suspiciously like an antenna. This is an 1800s pagoda with Sorin. It must have served the purpose of communication and or receiving transmitting energy. Notice the carousel on this one. Some Sorins are found at top step pyramids. I found this painting on a Japanese Google search, but I couldn't determine its age. Of interest here is that the Sorins are shown as lit up. I've collected a few Buddhist stupa into one image. Their aesthetic value is good, but it's not a stretch to assume there is also an energy purpose, either as tangible electricity, or at the very least spiritual energy. The stupa bottom left and center, shows the tradition of threads lined outward from the center. According to some legends, there was a time when these circled the air like carousels, driven by a force inherent to the object. People would come from all over, to stand, sit or dance beneath them, and be healed, while the threads emanated energy from heaven. 
Stupas were also made for people to enter and meditate in. This is Tibet in the 1800s. Shwedig in Myanmar. This image is also in Myanmar. The base of the stupa is a dome, anda, which represents the dome of heaven that encloses the earth. Obviously a different cosmology than we've been taught in school. On top of it we find the world mountain, from which a mast, or yashti, rises to higher realms. This center pole represents axis mundi, the axis of the earth. Atop the mast there are umbrellas, chatras, which stand for the levels of heaven, devaloka. Our churches, cathedrals, mosques, and synagogues have similar features to the ones in Asian countries, but we no longer have the ancient descriptions that go along with them, at least not to my knowledge. While in Japan the tip of the antenna is labeled as a wish-fulfilling device, I found no such claim regarding cathedrals. Even so, it would make sense. People gather for Sunday service and say prayers directed upwards. I assume that these prayers travel along the walls to the top of the building, leaving it through the tip, shooting your thoughts toward the heavens. This is an Islamic masjid. Is it really all just decorative, or is knowledge of energy being applied? The Cathedral in Cologne. A side view. Do you think it makes a difference whether you direct prayers in such a building or a flat roof warehouse? The term Jacob's Ladder originates in a dream the biblical prophet Jacob had, in which he saw angels ascending to and descending from heaven. Jacob's Ladder was a large tower, some say staircase, connecting heaven and earth. This is a 1700s depiction of Jacob's Ladder. The image on the right is remarkably similar to the symbolic meaning of the stupa. We see the tip of the structure touching heaven, or perhaps even the heavenly ocean. A dome is open at top left, and the charge of energy or fire causes sparks to fly and people to fall from the tower. We see various levels, and at the bottom, the hill rock and four rivers going into four directions of the primordial ocean. Maybe it's no coincidence that there is a modern device in electricity called Jacob's Ladder. An article in Popular Mechanics titled How to Build Jacob's Ladder says, it consists of two vertical wires, connected by a buzzing electrical arc that slowly travels upward. The science behind a Jacob's Ladder is simple. When voltage is applied between conductors, in this case, the two wires, electrons on the positive side want to leap to the negative side. To do that, they have to overcome the insulating barrier of air between the wires. If you crank the voltage high enough, the electrons break free and turn the air into plasma. Since plasma is a great conductor of electricity, an arc appears between the wires. My point. All these pointed towers, spires and pillars could probably even today be used to create an enormous amount of energy. Maybe our ancestors knew of a way to harness free energy. If we had that, electricity companies could no longer control the market and overcharge for their services. Or, is it that these antennas and energy generators were destroyed because they were used as weapons? The Tower of Babel story seems to suggest so. One of the strangest parts of the Bible. Genesis 11 verse 1 to 9, New King James Version. The Tower of Babel. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, and a tower whose top is in the heavens, let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do, now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So, the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. The story has always bewildered me. Why would the one who created people in his image and seized them as his children, wish to disempower them? But reading the story in full, reveals that these people were up to no good. In spite of their advanced building and engineering techniques, they were an unloving and cruel people. 
so, their unified language in their tower was destroyed. Knowing what we know, there may be some truth to the story. Perhaps it concerns not only one tower, but all towers around the world. Today we are in fact so confused that we can't even remember what these towers were used for. Not only do we speak different languages, but there are so many other divisions among us that unified action is unlikely. Some people take the story of the Tower of Babel to mean that grand architecture and advanced technologies themselves are somehow evil. But that wasn't the problem. The problem is always a closed heart. If human beings manage to combine advanced tech with an advanced level of consciousness, then no corrective measures are needed. I'm not saying I subscribe to this theory that the buildings where weapons are used for evil. It's one option out of several. Which of these is true will no doubt become clearer once more people look into these things. I'll conclude this video with an image from the Crystal Palace exhibition of 1851. I don't know what these devices are, but they look similar to what we've been discussing here.